Okay. All right, go. Good morning and welcome to Willow Meadows Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us today, both in person and at home, online. Uh, before we get started today, there's a couple things I want to get you caught up on. First of all, James Furr is going to be retiring as president of Houston Graduate School of Theology this summer. Uh, we, we announced that uh, a, a, a bit back, but I just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, James has been such a big part of our church for many years, and he's going to be in our service in two weeks on the 16th to share about all these things. And then that afternoon, there's going to be a reception for him from 3 to 5 p.m. on the front lawn uh, of our church on the Belfort side that's going to be hosted by HGST. So I hope uh, that you'll be able to come that day and show some appreciation to him, whether it's in our service that morning or at the reception that afternoon. Speaking of HGST, HGST, like most businesses at this time, um, they're going to be doing some downsizing. Um, they are also going to be making some changes in their approach to theological education. They're moving from classroom-based to more field-based education. So uh, starting in the fall, they're only going to be renting the second floor uh, of the old children's building, which means the, the first floor of that building will be available, and we are looking for a renter. Uh, per our bylaws, I formed an ad hoc team to oversee this transition. They've been working with HGST. They also contacted a commercial realtor just so we might get some help um, in, in renting that space and um, got some positive affirmation for them. So our facilities team uh, this past week looked over a proposal from that commercial uh, real estate uh, agent and uh, have um, recommended that we uh, go into an agreement with them so we can get some help uh, looking for a, a renter for that floor. Um, as you can imagine, um, this is uh, pretty important for us, so it's good to have help. And, and part of that help might actually be you. Uh, you here, you watching at home. If you know of any potential renters for that first floor, uh, it likely would be something like a, a small school, uh, a homeschool co-op, um, a, a church, certainly, or a, or a nonprofit group. Um, that might be interested, uh, just let us know. You can contact John Maddox, who's our facilities team chair. You can contact anyone on the staff. Um, we would love to get in touch with people. And, and for that matter, you know, we have other space too that is used all the time. So if you know of any groups that maybe need a gym um, or need a big space like Fellowship Hall from time to time, maybe they need the conference room or a classroom, something like that. Um, we love having space for the community to use, and certainly it benefits us a bit financially as well. So um, as you just are talking to people in conversations, if you hear about something, please uh, let, let them know that we have space available. Let us know. We'll reach out to them and uh, appreciate your help and your prayers with that. Don't forget that next week is Mother's Day. Don't forget. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll be able to do something special for your mom, whether you are able to, 
to be with her in person or, or not. And uh, we will we'll be offering a, a special prayer for our mothers next Sunday. Finally, some anniversaries I want to acknowledge today. Uh, I don't even know if y'all know these are your anniversaries. Um, hopefully, my sheet is correct. Today is a Buddy's 12th anniversary as our drummer. He is so good. Um, it is David's 12th anniversary for playing bass and being band leader and being our tech guru and all the other hundreds of things that David does for us. So happy anniversary to David. And a couple that I missed, this is back when we weren't in person yet and my brain was still pretty, well, my brain's still pretty fuzzy, but back then it was really fuzzy. Uh, in January, it was uh, Johnny's 12th anniversary as our sound engineer. Yeah, he's, he's, oh, there he is. Yeah, Johnny's back there. He was checking the baby, but he's good. And in February, it was Soya's 17th as our organist. And so we are so grateful. We have the best team to create worship um, every week. And they sacrifice so much time as well as talent. And, and we are grateful to all of you. Thank you so much. Now it's time for worship. We are so glad you're worshiping with us. And let me open us in a word of prayer. Father, we now give this time to you. Uh, we pray that you will capture our hearts and minds and that just for a brief period of time, our lives can be about you. We pray that you will um, touch us and inspire us, um, that you will direct us, that you will fill us, that you will teach us and grow us and challenge us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from John 15, 1 through 8. Will you stand and join me in our call to worship? We are branches rooted in the vine of Christ. We come because we seek to abide in Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we long to be spiritually vibrant, alive, productive. If we abide in Christ, then Christ's words will abide in us. We come because we strive to be faithful disciples. We gather for worship now to the glory of the one God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. May we grow wildly as God tends us lovingly. Will you join us in song? around you. If you are here, just wave to your neighbor and pass the peace that way. 
If you're at home, send a text message, an email, or a phone call. May the peace of Christ be with you. Will you join me in our responsive litany of call and confession? Come with what you have. For you who grieve this day, know that you are invited to bring the broken pieces of your heart. Loved by one another, we discover God's love for us. Come with what you have. For you who come with gladness, know that your melody will find harmony. Accepting God's love for us, we are called to love one another. Come with what you have, for you weighed down by too many shoulds and what ifs. Know that here you may lay down the burdens of guilt and shame. Loved by one another, we discover God's love for us. Come with what you have, for you who have the answers, know that new questions await you. Accepting God's love for us, we are called to love one another. Come with what you have, for you who come seeking, know that your questions are safe in the presence of God. Loved by one another, we discover God's love for us. Will you join us in singing?
time, we will have our children's sermon. Those of you who are here, stay in your seats and listen to the children's sermon from there. At the end of the children's sermon, you can make your ways to the tables over here. I would like to share a book with you. It's called, Because a Little Bug Went Kachoo. You may not believe it, but here's how it happened. One fine summer morning, a little bug sneezed, kachoo. Because of that sneeze, a little seed dropped. Because that seed dropped, a worm got hit. Because he got hit, that worm got mad. And because he got mad, he kicked a tree. Because of that kick, a coconut dropped. Because that nut dropped, a turtle got bopped. Because he got bopped, that turtle, named Jake, fell on his back with a splash in the lake. Because of that splash, a hen got wet. And because she got wet, that hen got mad. Because she got mad, the hen kicked a bucket. Because of that kick, the bucket went up. Because it went up, the bucket went down. Because it came down, it hit Farmer Brown. And that bucket got stuck on his head. Because it got stuck, Farmer Brown phoned for help. Because of his phone call, policemen came speeding. Because they were speeding, they hit a big stone. And so one policeman flew up all alone. Because he flew up, he had to come down. And because he came down on the boat Mary Lou, and because he hit hard, he went right on through. He made a big hole in the boat Mary Lou. Because of that hole, the boat started to sink. And because it was sinking, well, what do you think? Everyone, everyone started to yelp and Mrs. Brown called on the phone for more help. Because of her phone call, more help came fast. They tied a strong rope to the Mary Lou's mast. And because of that rope, the boat didn't go down, but it had to be fixed, so they started for town. And because they went there, it's true, I'm afraid, they ran right into a circus parade. And that started something they'll never forget. And as far as I know, it's going on yet. And that's how it happened, believe me, it's true, because, just because, a small bug went ka -choo. So when that little bug sneezed, he had no idea all of the things that were going to happen as a result, did he? Of course, this story is just make-believe, but it got me thinking about how one action can lead to another. In fact, it led me to make up a little thinking game, which I call, what if, then maybe. So here's an example of how it works. What if today I run into someone who is going through a difficult time? And instead of just rushing on past, I stop and listen and offer them some encouragement. Well, then maybe that person will feel some hope. Now, what if that person feels better and when they see someone in need, they're generous and share what they have? then maybe the recipient is gonna feel a sense of gratitude. So what if this third person having their need met is now able to respond to a challenging conversation with patience instead of arguing? As you can see, these positive interactions could keep going on and on, even though I will never know about them. Well, I think that something similar happened to Philip in today's Bible story from the book of Acts. In the early days of the church, Christians were busy sharing the good news about Jesus with the people of Jerusalem. One day, an angel told Philip to go out to the desert. 
I think at first Philip must have wondered why, because there was plenty to do right there in Jerusalem. But Philip followed the angel's instructions, and he met a man from the country of Ethiopia. Philip was in just the right place at just the right time to answer the man's questions about scripture and share the gospel, and he led him to faith in Jesus. It turns out this man was an important government official in Ethiopia, and it is believed that when he got back to his country that he started the first Christian church there. As far as we know, Philip never saw that man again, but Philip was obedient to God's leading. So how about if this week you and I play the what if then maybe game? Let's each look for a way that we can be a positive presence in someone else's life. Thank you, Pam. If you are, would like to go to the children's sermon tables for children, you can go now. <laughs> This next song that we're singing this morning is one that we uh, have not done very often, um, but I would encourage you to sit and listen to the words or sing along with the words if you'd like. Um, this is Build My Life. Worthy of all the praise we could 
evangelism is a word that creates both excitement and fear in most Christians. If you have ever had the chance to bring someone to faith in Christ, you know how exciting that is. But the idea of talking about personal spiritual matters, especially with strangers, stirs up a lot of anxiety and fear for many of us. If you grew up in a Baptist church, especially one with an emotional youth group or one that kept score by baptisms, likely you have been exposed to varying degrees of evangelism encouragement and evangelism training and evangelism guilt. I was taught that if you're going to do evangelism, the question is not if you use a tract, but rather which tract you should use. The Four Spiritual Laws was probably the most popular, but I personally preferred Steps to Peace with God. Once your tract was chosen, then you had to decide in what setting and with what strangers you would approach and share your tract. Would you go to the mall? Would you go to a park? Or maybe just go knock on doors? When that approach didn't produce the desired results the church had hoped for, the church got more sophisticated. When I was at seminary, two required classes were personal evangelism and church growth evangelism. The church also developed classes with with big binders for their members to be more thoroughly trained in evangelism. Evangelism Explosion was the first of these classes followed by the Baptist copycat continuing witness training. Basically, it was more things to memorize before you went to the mall or went to parks or knocked on doors. I like the heart and the intent behind all these practices. Of course, we want to share about the love of Christ and the grace that we have received from God in Jesus. But maybe we made it a little too difficult are a little too awkward. Maybe we took something intended to be more organic and tried to systematize it so it could be mass produced. Maybe we took something that was intended to be all about life change and made it more about numbers and results. If you have a Bible nearby, please turn to Acts chapter 8. In today's text, we're going to find the first picture of one-on-one evangelism in the book of Acts. That's, and this is an important text. Uh, for us, and it was an important text for the early church because the man who was saved was Ethiopian. What Luke wanted to show when he included this story in the book of Acts was that the gospel is for the whole world. The good news is for everyone. What we see in Acts is the execution of the plan that Jesus laid out just before his ascension in Acts 1. Jesus said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which had been done, in Judea, which had been done, in Samaria, which had also been done, and to the ends of the earth, which was about to get started here in Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, I'll start reading in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as the lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Peter began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. 
Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all towns until he reached Caesarea. When Philip encountered this Ethiopian man, he heard him reading from the book of Isaiah. Uh, in ancient times, it was common when someone read for them to read aloud, even if no one was with them. We know this man was interested and curious in matters of faith because we are told that he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. This tells us that he was a Gentile known as a God-fearer. God-fearers were attracted to the monotheism and the high moral and ethical teachings of Judaism, and they followed some, if not most, Jewish practices. We know he was a God-fearer and not a convert to Judaism because even if he had wanted to convert to Judaism, and my guess is he did, he would not have been accepted because he was a eunuch. This physical mutilation would have kept him from being received as a proselyte according to Deuteronomy 23. But him being a God-fearer would explain why an Ethiopian had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and it would also explain why he had a copy of the Septuagint, which was the translation of the Old Testament into Greek. Philip, prompted by the Holy Spirit, approached this man as he read the suffering servant passage from Isaiah 53. I think it's important to note here that the Ethiopian had some curiosity and some interest in matters of faith. Philip was not cold-calling people. Now, maybe there is a place for that, but the pattern we see in Scripture is usually along these lines. First, spiritual curiosity is stirred, and then, uh, 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 you know, maybe that's in a person or maybe that's in a group. And then God calls someone to go to that person or to go to that group of people and share with them about Christ. You know, here in Acts 8, we see Philip going to this Ethiopian man who had a lot of curiosity. In Acts 10, we see a lot of spiritual curiosity stirred in a man named Cornelius, who God sent a very reluctant Peter to go and share the good news with. And of course, we see God stirring up interest in, in, in a number of cities in Asia Minor that he called the Apostle Paul to, and Paul would go and share the gospel and plant a church in those cities. It seems the most productive evangelistic conversations come when there is some kind of expressed interest. Browbeating someone who has no spiritual interest is more likely to build anger and resentment, and it might keep them from ever coming to faith. I think if we would just start by following the biblical example and try to engage the curious, I think we would be amazed at the impact that would make and how that would extend to so many other people. Philip's actions in our text also show us the need for the prompting of God's Spirit, which means we need to be open and listening for the prompting of God's Spirit. Philip was not doing anything uh, special in this text. He was walking down the road. He was doing a very mundane thing, but he was open and he was available to be the right person at the right time. See, that's what evangelism takes, is different people at different times. It's, it's like, the, it's like the, the bug that, that said ka You know, there's a starting place that has to get the ball rolling and there's all these pieces that need to fall into place. Great example was given to me by my personal evangelism professor at seminary, Dr. Roy Fish. Dr. Fish had a brother who was a contractor and uh, they were at a job and there was this big stone wall that had to be knocked down. And so he had working with him a guy who was really big and strong and so Dr. Fish's brother asked him to start knocking down the wall. So he got a sledgehammer and he started taking his swings at the wall and, um, you know, those first few swings don't do a whole lot. Little, little pieces come off here and there, but, you know, it stays pretty strong for a while. So he swung as long as he could until he got arm weary and then he took a break. Well, Dr. Fish's brother went over and noticed that the wall, while it still looked pretty much the same, was, was really shaky and about to give way. And so he went to his worker and said, I'll bet you I can knock that wall down in three swings. And the guy said, I just took 20 swings. You think you're going to knock it down in three? And of course, his brother took three swings and the wall came down. Some people like Philip, they take that swing and the wall comes down. But all those swings have to be taken in order for the wall to reach that point that it will fall. It takes different people at different times taking their swings to make that wall come down. 
I also want to note that I don't think Philip was obnoxious in his approach to this man. In verse 30, he just walks by the chariot, he overhears him reading, and then he just asks a very friendly question, does that make sense to you? Do you understand what you're reading? And I think the Ethiopian man saw this as an act of kindness because he invited Philip to join him in his chariot. And then he asked in verse 31, how is it possible for me to understand this unless someone explains it to me? You see, he had not grown up with stories of faith and instruction in the Old Testament. This was all new to him. And so now he has a copy of the prophet Isaiah. He likes what he's reading, but he doesn't have a base of knowledge to make sense out of it. Philip then used this text from Isaiah 53 to tell this man the story of Jesus. He was responding to his curiosity, and he was able to do so at a moment's notice because of his own spiritual health. Philip knew the scriptures well enough. He certainly had known Jesus and he knew the story of Jesus and how Jesus had impacted his life. As they talked, this Ethiopian man came to understand his need for Christ and was ready to become a follower of Jesus. We know this because of verse 36, when they passed by this water and he asked, what stands in the way of me being baptized? What, what hinders me from being baptized? Baptism was the picture of repentance and forgiveness. Remember that John the Baptist would baptize those who had repented and were ready to surrender their life to God. We we follow that same practice in our tradition. Baptism is a picture of the new life we have received in Christ. We bury our old life and our old self in baptism and we rise to walk in new life. The question that was asked in verse 36, what can stand in the way of me being baptized was a very significant question for the Ethiopian. Likely he had wanted to convert to Judaism and was denied. And so I think he is asking this question from a very deeply felt place. So what is it that's going to prevent me from converting to Christianity? What is it that's going to hinder me from being a follower of Christ? I think he was waiting for more rejection, more reasons why he couldn't convert. But much to his relief and delight, there was nothing to hinder him. Philip said nothing about race or religious background or physical mutilation or anything at all. Instead, the chariot stopped and they went down to the water and the Ethiopian was baptized. A God-fearing Gentile couldn't become a Jew because of physical mutilation, but he could become a disciple of Jesus because following Christ is a matter of the heart and mind not of race or ritual or physical condition. It's a spiritual experience. It is spiritual rebirth. Acts 8 is the beginning of taking the gospel to the world. And the message of the text is that nothing hinders anyone from coming to Christ. In the chapter that immediately follows Acts chapter 9, that's where Saul is converted, who of course becomes the apostle Paul. It's in chapter 9 that Paul is saved and Paul is commissioned. And it's no coincidence that this message from Acts 8, this message that begins the sharing of the gospel to the world is also the same message that ends the book of Acts. In Acts 28, Paul is under house arrest in Rome. And the book concludes with these words from Acts 28. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. With all boldness and without hindrance, just like with the Ethiopian man. So what is the part we play in the mission of sharing the gospel? More specifically, you might be wondering, is there a part that I can play in this process? I, I think there is. I, I think in some respects, we, we can each kind of fill the role that Philip did in this story. Remember that what Philip brought to the table is not a long list of completed evangelism classes. What allowed Philip to share with the Ethiopian was that he was available. He knew some scripture. He knew the story of Jesus, and he knew how Jesus had impacted his life. The best thing we can do to be a part of growing the kingdom of God one person at a time is to be available. I need to be open to opportunities to share faith when I'm on the road 
when I am just living my usual everyday life and I prepare myself by growing and, and consistently pouring into my spiritual life. I prepare myself by knowing some scripture. I don't need to know all scripture. I don't need to be able to recite all the books of the Bible in order, but if I can know the major themes of Scripture and know some of the passages and stories that share about God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness, that's good. I also prepare by knowing the story of Jesus. And I know my own story and what Christ has done for me. When I'm faithful in strengthening my own spiritual life and when I know what Jesus has done for me well enough to put it into some words, I'm equipped as a witness for Christ. I don't need to know a lot of techniques or tricks. I need consistent spiritual growth that will encourage me to engage with someone when I see some interest and curiosity on their part. We all need to take our swings because without everyone taking their swings, the wall is never going to come down. But remember that all our swings are different and look different. And they come at different times. You know, if you're swinging early in the game, it might not budge that wall much at all. But then there are some, the people with the gift of evangelism. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it, it's not a coincidence that evangelism is a spiritual gift because, man, God just equips some people that when they talk to someone about faith, those folks get saved. Man, when I was growing up, I, I admired and hated those people because it's like, I, you know, I talked to this person, you know, 14 times, and then this person comes along and says three words, and they go, oh, yeah, I want to receive Christ. I'm like, hey, what? What? I've talked to you for weeks. Some people just have that gift. Most of us don't. But there are so many ways that we can be a part of the process and take our swings. For example, showing someone acts of kindness is a huge part of sharing faith. And, and I think that's how our church is especially gifted. Our church is so gifted at showing acts of kindness. Uh, there, were just, there were a few of us at it, uh, Shern this week uh, doing food distribution for those experiencing food scarcity right now. Um, I, I always think back to Hurricane Harvey and so many acts of kindness this church did in people's homes. And, and, and we told you then, but I'll just remind you, we had, we had several people who contacted us after that who said, the work you did and the spirit in which you did it renewed my faith in God. I, I had written God off a long time ago. And you have sparked something in me. You've sparked a spiritual interest in me. And, uh, and I think I'm going to head back to church somewhere. Um, those acts of kindness can make such a difference. Uh, when we do our fifth Sunday's day of services, day of service, um, there's been several individual homes that we've worked on and I've heard back from a couple of those folks saying, I can't tell you what this did for me and what it did for my heart and my faith in God. Showing someone acts of kindness is a great way to share faith and take a swing. Offering grace and forgiveness to people instead of judgment, instead of offering no second chances. That makes a huge difference in someone's life. Loving someone unconditionally. What an incredible way to share the love of God. All of these things are so important in helping someone to come to faith in Christ. And the reason I say that is because when people, uh, when I ask people, so what was it that helped bring you to Christ? They always talk about acts of kindness that have been shown to them. They talk about how someone was kind to them, how someone listened to them, how someone loved them even when they weren't at their best. These are the things that help people come to Christ because, because here's how it works. When they do hear the gospel and they do hear about God's unconditional love for them and God's grace and the act of kindness God extended through Christ's death and resurrection, it is easier for them to believe that kind of love can actually exist because they have experienced true grace and kindness and forgiveness and love. It all plays a part. It all makes a difference. We have the story of Philip closing the deal, I guess you could say. But we don't have the story of so many who came in this man's life before. Who, who helped him have an interest in faith. Who helped him find his way to Jerusalem. Who helped him find his way to the scriptures. So many people that played a part in his life. New Testament evangelism calls us to commit, take discipleship, and to consistent spiritual growth, to make ourselves available to God and follow his promptings. It calls us to faithfully take our swings, 
And it calls us to pray and trust God. And the result, we go on our way rejoicing. And hopefully others will join us as we go. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for all that you have done for us in Christ, how you have saved us, how you have forgiven us, how you have given us new life and a new start and new opportunities to live. And that is good news. And that is good news we want to share. And I pray that we will feed that desire and we won't write it off thinking back to the past and things that have made us feel guilty or turned us off or made us feel like evangelism is a bad thing. I pray you'll just remind us through our text, through this story, that it's simply telling what we know. It's telling your story and it's telling our story and then trusting you. Because we don't know where we are taking our swings. We don't know when and where we are hitting that wall. But we want to be faithful. And there's joy in that faithfulness because it brings us joy anytime we get to share about the love of Christ. So help us to be like Philip. Help us to be available and open. Help us to listen. Help us to ask good questions and to ask those questions in a spirit of love. We don't need to manufacture or pressure or push anything. We just need to be open and available and continue our our growth in you so that we are prepared when opportunities come. Thank you that we have good news to share. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Craig. And thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If you have not accepted Christ as Lord, we would love to talk to you about that. The good news is that you have a God who loves you and has given you his very best, his one and only son. And so if you have any questions of what it means to be a Christian or come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, will you please reach out to us? We'd love to share with you on what it means to follow Christ as Lord. This Wednesday, we'll continue our discipleship class on spiritual practices. It'll be at 7 p.m. via Zoom. We'll send a link tomorrow with that information. We hope that you join us. We're reading Barbara Brown Taylor's book. Um, It's been a great book, and we've learned some great things of spiritual practices. You do not have to read the book to be part of the discussion. Come and learn these spiritual practices that help you grow in your faith. We hope to see you on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Our Fine Arts Camp registration has begun. That'll be July the 12th or the 16th. If you're interested in volunteering, we'd love to get you as volunteers. Or if you'd like to help with uh, giving a scholarship or help with the purchase of supplies for the, the camp, um, please let us know. Uh, talk to Sarah. She'd love to visit with you about volunteering or donating to that event. On May the 16th, we will be recognizing our high school graduates. And the gift that we give our high school graduate is a Bible. And this is not just a normal Bible, it is a very special Bible because it's a gift from you and it's a gift that highlights your favorite verse. And so would you please email me at egarcia at wmbc.org with your favorite verse. We love to highlight all your favorite verses so when our students open up that Bible, they know that they are being prayed for. But there also, there's some beautiful passage of scripture that helps them trust Christ and make good decisions and know that they are not alone, but the God who walks, walks with them and cares for them and loves them. And that is all through that scripture and that special gift. So we look forward to celebrating our graduates on May 16th. Uh, we have a team that's going on a border trip uh, down to the valley. And they are asking for certain uh, gifts, um, different uh, items that they're going to be taking, or if you'd like to donate to their trip to purchase those items, I will be sending out an email with that list of all items, as well as how that you can donate to that trip um, as we go and serve um, families on the border, uh, families who are seeking asylum on the border, as uh, that we go out and support and minister to them as well. Birthdays this week, Tommy Fraser. Fraser has his birthday today. I, we thought it was last month, but it's actually this month on today. Laura Peters' birthday is tomorrow. We look forward to celebrating her birthday. And then Emily Kripe turns one this week. So we look forward to celebrating her birthday as well. Now, will you please stand for our benediction? 
Jesus said, all authority, not some, but all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Amen.